Here we go, day two. <laughs> Do not see error. Yeah. yeah, this is a mystical night that it's going to be. That last uh, episode I showed, I don't know if everyone saw that the two, it was all the dating app and going through all the different dates, the excitement, the challenges, and the disappointments of dating. It could be called, because we had, we saw our characters going through this kind of designed, organized dating, and, and the system on earth was promising a 99.8% success rate. And that's 99.8% chance of being successfully matched with a life partner as part of the ego's procreative system to maintain linear time and body. For on and on and on and on. And then when they make it up the wall, the whole world disappears as they go up higher and higher to the wall of escape. Everything turns to like black crystals. They go up and then you see all these reminds me of the Matrix, when Neo goes to meet the architect, and you can see all those screens. And those are all those attempts. You can see all of Neo's emotions coming out on all these screens. And all the many attempts to find meaning, purpose, and form. And basically, uh, the architect then tells Neo the problem is choice. And in heaven, there is no choice, so the problem is choice. <laughs> the thing that is most revered in this world, everyone wants more choice. That's why they do meaningless jobs, uh, to earn money, so they can spend money in many, many ways, with the choice of their own. And in heaven, there is no choice, it's just pure ism. I have a little uh, bracelet that I wear everywhere, and when you put the little words together, it says, isness. I'm always reminded of isness. <laughs> it's like a present moment word. So, in the end, it was a 99.8% success rate for your pairing, but these two in the end decide to check the system, to let go of the rules of the world, let go of everything about this world, and to go for an escape. And they suddenly see the power of their mind, they suddenly see that nothing can block them and stop them from going for what they have truly wanted in their heart. When they go up, they see all these pairs, simulation pairs of um, attempts, like they've done this a thousand times, and 998 registered rebellions show up. So, in the real world, when, when you turn away from the light, those are registered rebellions. What they seem as successes down on earth, Jesus says you can't judge your successes, your advances from your retreats. So, we live, we seem to live, seem to exist in a world of duality, where one of the, the major goals is to find a life partner, to find a pairing that will go, and that seems to be something that's major part of success, that if you accomplish that one thing, then you're on your way home, you've succeeded. But from this episode we watched last night, we can see that even that is dualistic, because even a successful life match, match involves two, and reality involves one. So, it shows how even the things that are judged as the most successful on earth are still rebellions. They were registered as 998 rebellions. They tried it 998 times before, and this time they, they broke the loop, and they went for the unity, and then they had you saw everything ascend. All of the, the past rebellions were taken up, they were taken up, everything was taken up into the light. But it was simply saying yes to God, and that was the, what turned the key, so to speak. 
So, and I don't know, is anybody doing the workbook lessons with the daily uh, workbook lessons today? Mornings. Today is 300. Oh. Yeah. And this is the 300th day of the year. Only an instant does this world endure. It's probably one of the most striking, penetrating lessons in the entire Course in Miracles. Because he basically says that it's guaranteed that everyone who comes to this world is guaranteed two things. And those two things are death and sorrow. <laughs> everyone. <laughs> A hundred percent who come to this planet are guaranteed these two things. This, he calls it, he says, this is the certain lot of all who come here. The certain lot. Certain. Jesus uses the word certain lot. What is your lot in life? What is the, what is the extent of your life? The certain lot of all who come here are death and sorrow. He, he doesn't say the most certain or the but possibly the most, he just says that this, this is a certain lot of all who come here. So basically, he's describing the closed loop of the ego. We, we see it in terms of birth and death. Everybody must die. But, but he's teaching us that it's, it's a loop of, a certain loop of, of loss and death. And then, he, the lesson is, only an instant does this world endure. So he's given us some hints about the deeper meanings, like in most of us, you know, we've studied different religions and traditions. If you come from the biblical tradition, you know in Genesis, you know, it's the fall from grace. Basically, the book of Genesis is describing the fall from grace of humankind with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat from the tree, I warned you. Uh, and then they eat from the tree of good and evil, which is the tree of duality, and then this is what the time and space human race, that's what we seem to have. There's one point though in the text where Jesus said, God would never have put you in such a position. That would have been good to know as a Christian. That, you know, <laughs> A little pre, uh, prequel for Genesis. <laughs> what you're about to read is a story, and actually, capitals, God would never put you in such a position. Why would the God of love put a creation in a position for a fall from grace? Because you can see where the anger would come in. Even people who are very sincere Christians, from time to time, have huge anger at God, like when they read Genesis, it's like, oh, it's a bad story, it's a bad story, you know. And we're still paying the price. <laughs> One apple, my gosh. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> I'm a vegetarian, but one apple food. <laughs> That's a lot, of, that's a heavy price to pay, you know, for a mistake. Yeah. And Dirk was talking about you know, the coming here and one wrong turn, and you're still replaying that one wrong turn. And this is almost like a human, a one wrong turn for humanity. You know, one apple. All of the Osmond brothers. Um, did write this song, one bad apple don't spoil the whole bunch, girl, oh, <laughs> one more try before you get up on luck. One bad apple don't spoil the whole bunch. And what Jesus is saying, God would never have put you in that position. So immediately it takes God out of the equation of separation, because God was never in the equation of separation. If God did create the earth, uh, as, as Hadi says, God created the world in six days, time does not exist. God created the world in six days, time does not exist. You know, we, we needed something like that in our Bible school. We needed Hadi inserted like a, a hologram of Hadi. God, God created the world in six days. That's what they're telling me. Time does not exist. <laughs> 
but that's not reconcilable. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That is not reconcilable. So you can't put God into the equation without having anger at God. Because if God had anything to do with the world and the cosmos of time and space, then anger would be justified. It would be like, you messed up. You're the creator, and you messed up. You're the creator, and your creation wasn't perfect. So the, the main teaching of A Course in Miracles is that God creates in spirit. Christ is pure spirit. Christ never comes into form. You can, you can have a reflection of the Christ in Jesus, the puppet, reflecting the eternal nature of, of unconditional love, but, but, the, but the Spirit never comes into matter, because you can't take a realm of eternity and squeeze it into time. It's like in this world, trying to mix oil and water. When you try to mix those two elements, it doesn't matter if you use a, a ninja blender, yes. and you run it for like, all week. <laughs> you put the oil in, your ninja, you put the water in, and you, you run the ninja on high power for a whole week. Monday through Saturday, and then Sunday you check it, and you still have, you turn it off and it's oil and water. Spirit and matter don't meet, mix, because spirit's eternal and matter is not. Space-time is not. So that's the fundamental teaching, and that's why the whole Course is summarized in nothing real can be threatened, spirit, nothing unreal exists, the cosmos of time and space, herein lies the peace of God. So if we, if we want the peace of God, the peace is our goal, we just have to start to take that in in a very deep way. And this lesson, I mean, in the text, Jesus he basically gives us a different version of Genesis. It's a much better version, I think, than Genesis, because Genesis is a very long book. And he gives us one sentence to replace the entire book of Genesis. And that sentence is, Into eternity, where all is one, there crept a tiny mad idea <laughs> Yeah. at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. One sentence would be more accurate and more helpful. So if any of you, and some of you may, want to rewrite the Bible, I've <laughs> kept away from that, I could stir things up on the planet a bit, but if any of you have a desire to go to Greece and write, rewrite the Bible, there could be some resistance from the world. But, I would start off with, Chapter 1, Into Eternity, where all is one, that crept the tiny mad idea in which the Son of God remembered not to let. Then, when you get into his workbook, you get to Lesson 158, and he's, he's basically going to tell us this world was over long ago, and we are but mentally reviewing what has already gone by. Imagining that we make the journey again. We, we, imagining we're still in the journey. But we are mentally reviewing what has already gone by. So when you get to the real world and the angels are all there, this is what they're waiting to tell you. Nothing went wrong. Nothing went wrong. You have just been mentally reviewing what has already gone by. And the good news, the angels say, is it's over. It's, it's been over because, as I said earlier, the Holy Spirit answered the belief in separation, not successively, not like that, but simultaneously. The instant the belief seemed to arise, God gave the immediate answer and it was solved. And in a sense, the ego was history. If you're in a relationship and you say, hey babe, Sorry, it's over, your history. <laughs> when you tell a partner it's history, that's saying it's over. Your history. Your history, it's, it's over. And, and basically, that's what the Holy Spirit's answer was. It's history. It's, it's over. So, Lesson 300 is the first time where Jesus is really going to actually start to approach this topic now. Where he's going to say, 
only an instant does this world endure. In other words, in that instant when the Holy Spirit simultaneously answered the belief in separation, it was over. And now you'll find that in the Course in Miracles, Jesus is going to talk about these two instants. He's not really going to try to boil it down to something in time and space. Everybody knows in this world that computers work on the binary system. Computers are based on ones and zeros. Think of your mind, your split mind, as a binary system. And the one is the Holy Spirit in your right mind. And the zero is the ego. The ego is the zero, Holy Spirit is the one. Those are two instants that are completely different, but that are believed in. So, in terms of the tiny mad idea that I talked about, Jesus calls it at one point the unholy instant. He calls it the tiny tick of time. He has names for it, but it's the, it's the moment of terror, it's the moment of darkness, it's the moment of the belief in separation, and that in less than 300, he says, only an instant does this world endure. So you might say, all of time and space, and everything of what we call history, is all contained in that one instant. He's taking, he's collapsing down millennium, and he's saying, no, it's just an instant. And it appears in your mind as a choice. And the right mind, the answer, which we give it simultaneously, appears in your mind as a choice as well. And now, underneath every decision that you seem to make as a human being, every decision you make in terms of the realm of time and space, underneath this major complex uh, world of seeming trillions and trillions and trillions of decisions, if you come down from the tree, all the way down to the trunk of the tree, you will find that at, at the base of the trunk there are just two in instants. And he's saying, you, now, we, now we are shifting. This is less than 300. He's now on less than 300 out of 365. He's going to bring it home. <laughs> he's, he's now, okay, we've gone through 299. You're ready now. For 300, but 300 is going to be like nothing I talked about before, because only an instant does this world endure, and this world was answered. So from lesson 300 on now, you are being told you must embrace the holy instant. He's going to teach us now. He started talking about the holy instant, I think, around chapter 15 in the text. And now it's almost like he's up to work with us 300 saying, now go back and review your notes on the Holy Instant, because this is going to be your life from now on. You are just going to teach one instant, but it is an instant of release. It is an instant of joy. It is an instant of happiness. It is an instant of freedom. This is the instant. That everything that you seem to say and do, and everything was for. It doesn't matter about the relationships, he says, nothing. Uh, all your career, nothing. Uh, all your accomplishments and achievements, your awards that you achieved, nothing. You know, he's basically saying nothing, 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 nothing. Now everything comes down to teaching one instant, teaching the instant of release. And there's a lot of beautiful spiritualities, and some of the spiritualities do involve reincarnation, but reincarnation involves time. Reincarnation, if we're honest and we look at reincarnation, we can say it's a system of belief, or a theology, that describes the problem. That's all reincarnation is. It's a system of belief that describes the problem. I mean, there's really no other way to look at it, if you keep incarnating into a world of suffering, over and over and over again, and don't seem to recognize the mistake, and you just keep reincarnating and reincarnating and coming back. Like the, the episode last night, 998 rebellions registered, which on earth are seen as successes, Nine, 
99.8 success rate of finding your perfect match and then when you get to this point. No, those were all failures. And the saying yes to God, saying yes to the holy instant is the success. So, so then your life becomes not so much about form, because your, the form is really irrelevant, but the content of the holy instant is an instant of release, it's an instant of happiness, of joy. It can be felt, it's the Beatitudes in the Bible that Jesus was talking about. That's why he emphasized the be attitudes, the attitudes that you should be to demonstrate eternity, to demonstrate God, to demonstrate divinity, be attitudes. And that's what the Holy Instant is. So that, that uh, lesson comes around all the way to a sense of gratitude, like we now seek to find our true identity, which the Holy Instant is our gateway to, and, and that true identity is eternal, it's eternity. So, we have now come to a point in the workbook lessons where at Lesson 300 he's saying, real simply, now you have to devote your, the rest of your determination and efforts to eternity. Period. And, and when you start to look at it, it's actually, it's actually important to start to realize, wow, if I'm devoting my my heart and my mind to eternity, then I will pull my devotions away from whatever I was working on before. Mm -hmm. Because what he's done is he's taken, it's almost like if we had 15 things that we were working on, and he's taken a little brush, and he brushes them all together, and he, into like a little pile of dust, and he goes, that's the unholy instant. <laughs> that's what you were, that movie you were working on, that, Whatever you were working on, he takes it up like brushes it like a pile of dust. That's the unholy instant. <laughs> and then he's saying over here is the attitude of joy, where he's saying, be in the miracle and let your whole life be totally involuntary. Where you just want to be an extension of love, just an expression of joy, and you are unconcerned about the form that it will take. Meaning, you're not going to be caring what other people think because you're, the holy instant is too important. It's not about other people, what other people think. It's not about the image that you have in the world. I was suggesting earlier that some of you could rewrite the Bible. You know, why not? That could be kind of a fun, <laughs> from joy, you know, rewrite it. Very short and succinct too, start off with chapter one, into eternity, <laughs> for all is one, the crypt of time, you may have idea, which the Son of God remembered not to let, and then go on from there, in the most joyful way. And, and that would be the, the book of happiness, you know. <laughs> that would, you know, people talk about these scriptures as if they're like infallible, or they're an endpoint. But even with Jesus' scripture, we'll call it A Course in Miracles, he says this course is a beginning and not an end. You can think of his Course in Miracles as like a trampoline. And children know that there's only one purpose of a trampoline. And there aren't many purposes, there's only one. And they get on it and they use it. They know it's to play on and to spring, spring and pretend like you're flying <laughs> through the air. You have no gravity. They just get on it and they, they can be on it for hours, they love it so much, but they, they know that the only purpose of the trampoline is to play. And really you can start to think of A Course in Miracles that way. It's not some kind of a daily routine or some kind of a ritual or some kind of a thing that you have to I mean, in the early days of the Course, there were some strange things that happened with the book. There was one teacher of the Course that, that actually told his students, never let A Course in Miracles touch the ground. And that was an actual teacher of the Course who basically, I would call that spiritualizing matter. You know, like, hey, it's something in the United States, you're not supposed to let the flag touch the ground. You know, it's like, 
fun. Oh, that's, a, that's a bit of <laughs> a dull look for you there. Yes. My feet can touch the ground, but the flag can't. Okay, well, this teacher said, don't ever let the course touch the ground because the course is a holy book. Mm. I'd say the ground is holy too, though, so, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's not really a problem. But. There was one time that Judy Sketch, I got to talk to one of the original four quite a lot with a lot of dinners and lunches, but she was describing one time she, she didn't travel much, but one time she was invited to go to Australia. And she went to Australia and her teenage daughter wanted to come with her, Tamara, who's now, as far as I know, still the president of the of Foundation for Inner Peace. And she and her daughter flew there and they flew to do a little tour of Australia. And and the Australian people were excited, and the media and the press were saying, there's a holy lady coming to speak on the holy book. Well, the rebellious teenage daughter was like, what the hell is that? Is that? First of all, my mom is not a holy lady. You should live with her. <laughs> uh, you know, the teenage year was like, you should live with her. I live with her. <laughs> and so the Australian and press was interviewing him, the teenage daughter, about, tell us about the holy lady who's going to talk <laughs> for the first time in Australia about the holy book. And the teenage daughter said, yeah, I'll tell you about the lady. She farts and fucks like any woman on the planet. And you can only count on the teenager. <laughs> no filter. <laughs> no filter. No filter whatsoever. So, anyway, it just, it just, Judy's ready to go give her talk and everything. And um, people are like, waiting to hear about the holy book from the holy lady and the teenagers. Um, she's just like, so after the, the talk, the, I remember, she, she says, what is this? This is like some kind of a farce. This is some kind of a game. You know, I don't know what's going on here, but this, this isn't real. This isn't real. This isn't authentic and everything like this. And, and Judy said, well, you know, this is the people, and this is the first time, and this, they've encountered it, and it's, it's like their expectations, and I'm just, you know, fulfilling, trying to do what I'm called to do, come here and do everything. And the daughter says, it's just not right. Something's really off about this, something's really off. So, so the next talk that Judy gave, she went in, and the original course was published in three hard copy volumes of this high. You put the three volumes, and they were about like this. They were they weighed quite a lot. I don't know how many pounds, but it was a lot. She went out there. She put the books from the from the podium on the floor, and she stood on the three books and gave the talk, standing on top of the Course of Miracles. Because of what her daughter had said to her, and something is not right. Like, you cannot be making things in this world and calling them holy, unless there's something much deeper underneath it. And, and she wasn't perceiving what that was. And so there was a, some gasps. <gasps> holy lady is standing on the holy book. <laughs> and, and that again was an undoing. Uh, we could say spiritual specialness. Even that was a was an example to to do something in form, like Hobby sometimes says about breaking statues of Jesus. You know, if if there's a, such a strong identification with something in form, you know, there was a there was a book that was written one time, and the title of the book is "If You Meet the Buddha on the Road, Kill Him." That's the title of the book. You meet the Buddha on the road, because if you meet the Buddha on the road in form, it's not the Buddha. It's an idol. The Buddha is not a man. You know, it's not, and, and we could say the same with Jesus. Jesus seems to be a very historical figure that is raised up and glorified by some, and 
As the Course says, many bitter idols have been made of one who offered only love. Mm -hmm. So there's bitter idols and there's glorified idols that are made of the form. And what Jesus is asking us to do is go so deep into the presence of the Christ, the living Christ, that the eternal Christ, the vibrant Christ, be that Christ. Be who you are, be who you were created to be forevermore. That is the point of spirituality, to be who you already are, to, to be what you are, Christ. So, back to Lesson 300, only an instant does this world endure. It's, it's, it's another version of Lesson number 7, which is, I see only the past. Jesus is trying to train our thought process to start to be able to view the world with a common, relaxing, simple thought in our mind. I see only the past. Because if we're going to let go of the past, which we have to do if we're going to let go of the unholy instant, we have to first see things exactly as they are, not as, as the ego set them up. And the ego set up a very vast system of differences and hierarchies of better and worse. We saw in the first episode last night, the, the Robert, you know, in his whole scheme of, of trying to overcome feeling worthless and unimportant with inventing a starship program where he's the captain and everybody has to do whatever he wants, including his boss, including everyone has to be subservient to him. That the ego has invented a very complex system to obscure the awareness that everything in form is the past, equally. So there's no way you can put some aspects of the past up as idols and push some down. There's no way that you can make some aspects of the images important and say some are unimportant. There's no way you can generate hierarchies if they're all the same. That's the first principle of A Course in Miracles. There's no order of difficulty in miracles. And that's why Jesus seems so extraordinary in this world, because he seemed to be the, the answer to whatever was confronting, whether it was physical symptoms, blindness, uh, someone was lame, they couldn't walk, someone was possessed by demons, or Lazarus and others were literally dead. He came upon them when they, in the world's terms, had stopped breathing, no more motion, no more movement, and then came back to life. It, it completely reversed the, the, the laws of this world with one simple principle, there's no order of difficulty in miracles, because there's no hierarchy of illusion. One illusion is not bigger, smaller, greater, less. And you can see all the things that the ego uses to keep the mind trapped, like fame and greed, like um, everything is part of narcissism, of start trying to feel self-important in a personality way, all of that is just an egoic attempt to hide itself and keep itself in the unconscious mind. And really, all of that is just one instant. So we're here to free our mind of the unfolding instant, from the tiny tick of time. That it starts to get you thinking a little bit, when you start to think of things like in the world there's, there's debt. You know, a lot of people in the world are, are told you have to go into debt. Some of us were taught that you, if you want to succeed, you, you have to go into debt. Maybe it's for education, or maybe it's for some kind of work training, or something. And it wasn't just about our vocations, but then it was about our houses. Like, you, you buy houses, you go into debt. It's a mortgage. And then people feel like there's something hanging over them their whole life, like a mortgage to pay. Their, their whole life comes, becomes minutes and seconds and hours and days and weeks, and mortgage payments, utility payments, tax, tax payments, you know, you see how depressing the human condition can be if it's all based on a system of lack and debt, and it's all a sense where you can borrow 
on time. That's all a, a, a mortgage or a debt is. It's on time. It's projected out over time. And then you see the mystics and saints who are always saying, live simply, live in simplicity, St. Francis was saying. Look at the Look at the birds, look at the creatures, St. Francis would say in Italy. Look at the creatures, how simple they live. The birds, the sparrows, need only a drop of water and some berries. No mortgages, no concern <laughs> about the, the things that become so complex in the split mind. And they start to feel so heavy. But they're all inventions of time. Mortgages are inventions of time. Loans are inventions of time. And and when you look at the sparrow, live like the birds live, you know, uh, it was basically saying, look how simple the birds have it. They just have, look, need a little sip of water and a few berries. Jesus used the analogy of, of flowers. He was using the analogy of flowers 2,000 years ago. Look at the lilies of the field, he said. These beautiful white flowers that look so beautiful and elegant. Look, just Jesus saying, look at the lilies of the field. They neither spin nor toil. He's making the comparison in a helpful way of saying the flowers have a very, they sway in the breeze. They have their beautiful white petals. They, the sun comes on them, the rain comes on them, the wind comes to them, and they just, <coughs> like a geisha dancing. Just dancing. Yeah. Here I am, I'm beautiful. <laughs> my beautiful shape and my beautiful color, my whiteness, my beautiful whiteness. Enjoy it. It's, it's free. It's free for you. It's free for you to take in. Enjoy it. They neither spin nor toil. What a contrast. Jesus is using a flower as a contrast to the human condition. Mm -hmm. And he's, I think he's doing it because he's saying you need to live in simplicity. For Jesus to say live in simplicity, he's really saying think in simplicity. Let your thoughts be very, very simple and pure. Focus on what is really important. And then he would say things like, take no thought for the morrow. You know, he would say, take no thought for the morrow. So he was actually inviting us with that simple little saying, take no thought for the morrow. He was inviting us to be intuitive and to just pray in the moment and, and have a practice of this beautiful prayer going in the moment and then let everything emerge from the prayer of the moment. Don't plan the future. He's even telling us in Work Request in 135, you know, you know, that we're not even to organize the present. I think that's been, if we're honest, that's been part of our addiction. We, we, instead of becoming, instead of human beings, we become human organizers. And because human, a being doesn't have a to-do list. A being just is. Being. Being is, is being in the moment. But, but there's no to-do list, and all of us have had to-do lists. So what are to-do lists except attempts to organize something? Organize our day. Instead of just living in the moment and saying, what will the day bring? I have no idea. I'm very happy. I have no clue. What's your plans for the day? I have no clue. What are you going to do tomorrow? No clue. <laughs> yeah. it, imagine how joyful that feels to be clueless and to just feel like you're carried by the Spirit in the moment. Like the lilies of the field, you know, they neither spin nor toil. Do the lilies of the field, are they thinking, I have to work for a living? Do lilies of the field have careers? Do lilies of the field organize their days. <laughs> the mornings, sunshine's coming up, the dawn's coming up, the, the flower is not going, what am I going to do today? <laughs> no, it, we would laugh. It would be a comedy if we made a cartoon about the flower thinking, what am I going to do today? Because even 
as far as animated films would go with Disney, that would be kind of boring because there's not a lot of action. It's sway here and there. You know, but that's it. <laughs> One time I was watching movies because I love movies so much, and I somebody said, David, you need to watch this movie that's filmed over in Europe. And I said, What's the name of it? And they said, It's called My Dinner with Andre. If any of you have seen My Dinner with Andre, and I thought, that's the name of the movie, My Dinner with Andre. And they said, yeah, it's just two guys having dinner, the whole movie. <laughs> that's, that's the setting, that's, that's the scene. But they have one of the talks like we have. That's what Andre Greger and, and this other guy, Wally, are are just talking about what's it all about. They're having a what's it all about dinner, and they're filming it. And it, you know, the big action scenes are when the waitress comes into the scene and, <laughs> and <laughs> brings some food, or brings a menu, you know. That's like, you talk about Arnold Schwarzenegger and action films, this is like, I said, so it's just two guys having dinner. And they said, yeah, that's the movie. That's essentially, that's the movie, two guys. My dinner with Andre, it's Wally and Andre are having a very deep talk. We know, we've had some pretty deep talks, and <coughs> it's pretty exciting, some of our talks we've had, they're very exciting, like, there's a high vibration to the discussion. You know, it's that whole encounter, and it's very deep. But to make a movie about that, it seems kind of funny, because we think of movies as having a plot some different scenes, some different characters in action. These are just basically two main characters, and they're just having a dinner. I love the movie. It's still, I think, it might still be in the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment, you know, one of those rare kind of movies. But, but that is what we're giving ourselves over to. We're going for content. We're going for love. One point of the text, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit only perceives two orders of thought, love and call for love. So with perception, the Holy Spirit only perceives these two orders. So to the Holy Spirit, everything that's happening is either one of these two categories, love or call for love. And then Jesus says, you are not able to do this because your mind is too bound to form and doesn't understand what content is. So he's using a form content analogy along with love and a call for love, and he says, the Holy Spirit sees everything as love or a call for love, but you cannot do this because you're too bound to form and you don't know what content is. Love is content. So when we say we're going to devote our life to the Holy Instant, we're going to teach the Holy Instant. We're going to teach it any way that it's given us to teach this Holy Instant of release. In whatever way, shape, form, it's the book, it's going to be given to us. We don't even have to figure it out. It's just going to be shown to us. It's going to be handed to us on a silver plate, silver platter. Here you go. It's a setup. You know, it's a perfect setup for you. Here you go. Have some fun. Have some fun with it. That's that's what the Spirit is doing. And, and that's an opportunity for us to strengthen the awareness of content and to loosen our attraction, our addiction, and our sense of feeling that we already know what form means. What's the Socrates quote you heard? It's the, 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 the science is the art of dissolving errors. It was never about finding the truth. Finding the truth. Socrates. It's an art. Science is an art. It's science an art is of the solving. art of solving errors. It was never about, never about finding the truth. And that fits with our whole talk of science from yesterday. You know, it, it, was, it was never designed for the truth. So it's like we can't use the means that were designed to solve errors. Because these errors are, are errors of, of form, you know, that's, 
We, the hope was that education and science would ultimately handle all the problems on Earth, from pollution to overcrowding to not enough food or not enough resources. And, and now I, I hear a lot of scientists are now putting that all onto AI. <laughs> now AI is, is supposed to clean up pollution, handle all the problems of, of lack and, and problems of distribution of uh, resources and everything. But I think before that, it was science was, was, was put onto science as a hope that would happen, or even education. My mother was, was an educator, and, and so, yeah, I would say in our household, education was seen as the answer. That, uh, that basically not having education was being seen as ignorant, and then having an education was, was going to be the answer that would solve all the things. And, but we're starting to realize that education and learning is still part of time. It's, it's learning about things, about... Even in medicine, you know, you used to go to... Decades ago, they, they had uh, doctors that were called general practitioners. Anything that was wrong with you, you could go to your GP, general practitioner, and say, this is what's bothering me. Now, if there are few general practitioners around, but then they... that's just your introduction. You go there, you get an introductory meeting, an intake, and then you're referred to a specialist, you see. So we have to start to realize that's where education has gone. It's gone into more specialization, and more studying the parts, and more analyzing the parts. If you go to an eye specialist, you know, you have to have for that, you know, they, they will send you to, oh, this is the best specialist for whatever ails you for your eyes or your kidneys or your liver or whatever there are specialists and and the whole movement towards specialization and and trying to treat the the error in specific forms is under is under the false assumption that the problems are specific if somebody says you have a liver problem there seems to be a widespread general acceptance on, in the human race that you know, liver problem. Everyone agrees? <laughs> Millions of people. You should go see a liver doctor. <laughs> and Jesus is like, how? That's pretty lazy. Yeah. <laughs> when I've told you there's only one problem and one solution, and the problem has already been solved, and now you've broken the problem up into millions of problems with millions of specialists to try to handle it. And then the fun part is if you do try to go to the specialist, sometimes the specialist will run the test and say, it's inconclusive, I don't know what this, but you're the specialist, you're the one who's supposed to know. I know, but I don't. Get a second opinion. And what if the second opinion doesn't come with a conclusive diagnosis, then get a third opinion. <laughs> oh, something fishy here, something sneaky. <laughs> if the specialists are saying, I don't know, <laughs> they're the ones that are supposed to know. <laughs> According to this system, they're the ones that are supposed to know. They're getting paid a lot of money to be right about knowing what the diagnosis is. If the specialist says, I don't know, then people get depressed, you know, say, okay, can you prescribe some antidepressants? Because <laughs> I believe in a system that told me that you were going to tell me how to fix my problem, and you're saying, oh no, give me antidepressants then. Because it's depressing when you search for answers where there are no answers. And Jesus is saying, the kingdom of heaven is within, and the Holy Spirit is the answer to any problem that you perceive. There is an answer that will, it sounds like the Beatles song, let it be, there will be an answer. There is an answer for any problem that you can perceive, and the Holy Spirit 
That's the Holy Spirit's function, to filter through your belief system with the answer that you can hear, that, that is most practical, that's most applicable for you at any given moment. And that's also part of dedicating yourself to the Holy Instant, is you're dedicating yourself to the Holy Spirit, who is your comforter, your counselor, your cheerleader, <laughs> your inspiration, and ultimately your, your answer. You know, prayer is why is, is basically the meaning of the miracles, and when we pray, we receive very practical answers. And those answers don't have to even be related to specific problems, they can just be guidance on, on what you're supposed to say or do. And then when you follow it, you know, we know how that feels when you get an inner prompt, a little inner nudge. Sometimes it comes there and it repeats itself over and over. This little inner nudge, and a nudge, and a nudge, and you finally go, okay. And then you follow the inner nudge and boom! It's huge joy coming from following that little persistent inner nudge. And Jesus says, there are many answers you have received but have not heard. They are there waiting for you. They're, it's like all the answers are all contained in this, this Holy Spirit, this presence within, and we have to turn and be reliant and turn to the Holy Spirit for the answers. What's the option? What's the other option of turning to the Holy Spirit? It's turning to the past. It's turning to the unholy instant for answers. And if we live our life based on looking to the past to solve our present dilemma, which is clinging to the past, you know, it's like, it's like a prisoner turning to his captor and saying, Give me some advice to be free, and the captor smiles, that's not my job. My job is to hold you captive, I'm not going to be giving any advice on getting free. You can't turn to a captor to find freedom. But when we look to the past, which is what the ego is, the unholy instant, we're learning to, we're looking to have a solution from the past. So I like that when Jesus was asked, is, is the spiritual journey difficult? He said, no, it's not really difficult, but it is very different. And I think that's the one telltale characteristic that I felt in my life, because some of you might remember that famous uh, Robert Frost poem, you know, The, the Road Not Taken. You know, Two roads diverged in a wood and I I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. For some of you remember the beautiful Disney movie Pocahontas, when her father wants her to marry Copalum, and, and she's attracted to this explorer from John Smith, who's come from, from England, and she's falling in love with John Smith, but her father is like, no, you have to marry the warrior, Pokemon and everything. And then finally she goes off and to talk to Grandmother Willow. But there's one scene where she's paddling her canoe up, and there's two different directions the canoe can go. And one is very wide, and one is very narrow. And Jesus talked about the narrow path. One is very wide, because many, many, many go down that path, and, and that's the path of tradition. Her father's going, you're the princess, you know, you need to do, follow the path of your mother, you need to marry Kokoam, and it's, your, your life is set out for you. Here's this wide path, and then there's the narrow one, and then there's a point in Pocahontas where she starts to paddle her boat up the narrow stream. Like, she's made the decision, she's going to go for, for truth. She's made the decision, she's going to go against what seems to be the common accepted way, the wide path, and go with the straight and narrow path, Jesus talked about. So, that's the exciting part, that's the adventure of it, is that, that you're, you're not going to go down a well-beaten path, 
that hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of others have gone down. Your, your way will be different. You know, like with Bill and Helen, you know, these were two research psychologists at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in New York City, but when Bill gave his little speech that day, there has to be a better way of living, there's so much anger and frustration in our, even on our staff uh, at the school, there has to be a better way of living. And then he was surprised when Helen said, you're right, Bill, and I'll help you find it. He actually thought after he would give his little speech that she would laugh in his face. He expected her to laugh, but she didn't. She said, you're right, Bill, and I'll help you find it. That was that little willingness to go for the the straight and narrow, for the pathway that, that opened up many things in their life that they could never have foreseen. And I think a lot of us can relate to that, because our, we can see our life is now going in a very, very, very different direction than, than we had considered before. We don't even know what it will be. Jenny Barrett, just the, the center, you just got this center, like officially bought it, was it in February? No, it's just a couple of weeks ago. It's a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> well, okay. that part was a couple of weeks ago, but yeah, July yeah. the summer. Um, yeah, the, the cottage and the nest. <laughs> July, okay, so don't yeah. <laughs> yeah, but this is, this is like, it feels like it's just another piece of the puzzle that yeah. clicked. I know we had a number of calls where you were like, I don't know if we're going to make it. We're we're on the verge of being thrown out. <laughs> we have been thrown out. Yeah. Jenny would say, we have been thrown out, but we don't feel to leave. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's an interesting. <laughs> so that's that. That was intense, I'm sure, and all of us have gone through intense moments where something seems to be giving us messages from the world, and then we have something inside us saying, stay here, don't, no, nope, don't take that move yet, pray, pray, stay with it, stay with it, and, and you do, and then, yeah, and you're getting invitations, you were saying South Africa, and yeah, there's different places around. This message, it's, we're teaching the holy instant, so this is the instant everyone on earth has been waiting for, and we get to teach it. Isn't that wonderful? We get to teach something that the whole world is waiting for, and has been waiting for, for hundreds of years. You know, it's almost like, oh my gosh, some call it the good news. You know, this is, yeah, the holy instant is the good news. Because it's a moment of freedom, of innocence, no matter what the form is, to be able to be that smiling, shining face that says, no, oh, it's not that way. Oh, I see a sign, kindness is free, back there, right under, right above. It's, and this is, they're just nestled under, kindness is free. It, I said on the weekend, I was saying that Javi and I are doing an experiment, and, we, and you can feel it, it's like a, a palpable experiment, every day, it's like, here we go, another day of the experiment, because what we're experimenting with is this, joy of, of giving, this joy of extending, that feels so vibrant, and yet it goes against all the laws of the world. <laughs> it's basically the world saying, no, that's, that's not an experiment at all, that's insanity. <laughs> and yet, to, to stay with the joy of that is, is so beautiful every day, because it gets stronger and stronger in awareness, like, yes, yes. Yes, this is why I've devoted my life to this. Yes, of course this is what I want to give my heart to. Yes, I can give my heart with, in fullness, without any reservations, any doubts, any fears, any holding backs. I don't have to have mixed emotions about this experiment. This, I, I'm all in. It's like basically saying I'm all in. And, and I was using the word experiment because Experientially, it does kind of feel like an experiment, you know, it, it, it feels like we're every day saying, here's what I feel I do, now show me that this is what's important, show me that this is what's real and true, and the more you 
repeat the experiment, so to speak, or stay with the purpose, then you get these confirmations, and more confirmations, and more confirmations. And before long, then you're getting so many confirmations that, that what used to be the ways of the world, or those doubt thoughts, they just start to fade away. They're just like getting weaker and weaker and weaker. You know, they, they're getting so weak, they're fading away so much that they don't seem like obstacles anymore. And I think that's what Jesus is saying, is, is stay in trust, stay in faith, and lay down the fight. As human beings, we have perceived ourselves as, as fighters. You know, we're fighting the good fight. You know, Jesus doesn't understand this, but we say, we're fighting the good fight. We're, we're going to fight till the end. And, you know, all, all of our songs, fight, fight for what you want. You know, fight for what is good, fight for what is right, fight for justice, fight, fight for survival. You know, there's always a fight going on, and Jesus is saying, lay down the fight. There's actually no fight going on here. You've misperceived the fight, where there is no fight. <laughs> and, and that feels actually relaxing, to lay down the fight. He's saying, lay down your sword, lay down your, your efforts and your pursuit to change the world, or to fix something in the world. That, that episode last night was so good, because in the end, they, even the dating scene seemed like a bit of a fight. Uh, I think they were both either bored, or uh, wondering what was even happening. They seemed more and more detached. There was no uh, spark. Uh, and some of their later dates, you know, where they were just kind of going through the motions. And most human beings have, have felt that, like going through the motions feeling. And nobody likes to just think that they're going through the motions. For what? It's like that Beatles song, du, 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 du. it's just another day, du, 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 du. it's just another day. You know, it's, it's sad, that, that's kind of a sad song. It's one of the saddest Beatles songs, and yet people listen to it because they relate to it. Brooke pushes a comb through her hair, and you know, it's just facing another day. That's, they call it the human grind. You know, the daily grind, facing another day, another day. What would it be like if you quit experiencing days as days? where you got so absorbed in a calling, so absorbed in a purpose, so lit up, so on fire for something, that you ceased to pay attention to the passage of time. That was like the, the episode we were with, when the two were together and they were in the joy and laughter. There was a lot of jokes between Amy and Frank. There was a lot of jokes, a lot of jokes, and, and they really weren't that aware of the passage of time on their first date, and then they felt such an immediate connection when they came together on their second date, that they agreed to not keep track of time. That, that was their agreement, they, I will not, you will not keep track of time. And that's, that's a way that Jesus wants us to live, to, to be unconcerned with the passage of time, and allow Him to show us how to eliminate time entirely from our awareness, to purify our mind and our heart from time. So, let's dive in today. Isn't that wonderful? That is exciting. <laughs> it, that's the adventure, you know, that's the adventure of all this. We can really dive into this and say, oh, whatever I seem to be preoccupied with, that's just been nicely taken by Jesus and sh put into the, the uh, unholy instant pile. <laughs> He's like clearing it off, sleep, 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 sleep. And He is sweeping our mind. He's sweeping every day, sleep, sleep, sleeping away. Why are you concerned about that? 
him, why are you worried about that? I've told him a hundred times. <laughs> He's got this little broom in there. <laughs> sleep, sleep, sleep. Keep, the, keep your floor clean. Keep the altar of your mind and your heart clean. Just sleep, sleep, sleep away these things. Take no thought for what you should wear or what you should eat. Seek first the kingdom of heaven, and all things else shall be added unto you. You know, it was, it was a beautiful message. It is a beautiful message of, of excitement, of joy, of love, of laughter. You know, it's, it's freeing. So. so, what do you want to explore in the context of, <laughs> of all that today? Yeah. I think it's awesome topics, right? The Holy Instant. Yeah, how to find the whole instant, like, to release, release the form. Yeah, I remember when I first was reading the Course, when I got this, about chapter 15, when he started on that topic, and I was just like, oh my gosh. I think I needed that too, because I think uh, yeah, the, the shadows of the past I've been referring to, that's 17, but chapter 15 is titled The Holy Instant. First section, the two uses of time, the end of doubt, littleness versus magnitude, practicing the holy instant, the holy instant and special relationships. That's an interesting section, section four. Practicing the Holy Instant. This course is not beyond immediate learning, unless you believe that what God wills takes time. And this means only that you would rather delay the recognition that His will is so. The Holy Instant is this instant, and every instant, the one you want it to be, it is. The one you would not have it be is lost to you. You must decide when it is. Delay it not, for beyond the past and future where you will not find it, it stands in shimmering readiness for your acceptance. That you cannot bring it into a glad awareness while you do not want it, for it holds the whole release from littleness. So it seems like that's the most important thing is, is once we realize, okay, this is what Jesus really wants from me, then He wants me to teach the Holy Instant. He wants me to teach it and demonstrate it. That's like my sole focus now. And then He says, the one instant, the instant you want it to be is the one that it will be. So you have to want it. So then we get back to starting to acknowledge in our mind the power of our wanting. That that is no small power. We have a very, very, very powerful mind. And when that mind wants something, it focuses on whatever that something is. I was named after King David in the Bible, and he was the one who wrote all the songs, the Psalms, but uh, my grandmother knew the 23rd Psalm by heart, and it starts out, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's the start of it. So he's like aiming it towards the world. And to want God, to want the Holy Instant, is really to release the mind from wanting the unholy instant, the things of time. And our programming has taught us to want the things of time. You know, that's that's part of growing up in this world, to build a self-concept that is capable of getting some of those things in time. And we need skills, we need abilities, we need learning, we need resources, you know, it's almost like a, there's an equation. And I do know when I started traveling years ago, when I would go around to so many places and get invited into so many houses, that it did have the feeling right away like a fairy tale, like I was having these 
deep encounters with people I never met, and they were saying, yeah, get a cup of tea, have some chocolate, have this, have that. They were like opening up their houses, their hearts, their minds, and welcoming me, and everything was handled so fully and so completely that it felt, started to feel very surreal, like, this, wait a minute, this is un... this feels very unreal, because it was beyond those ways that I had learned so well, the programming and conditioning. You know, you need this, 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 and suddenly I'm traveling and I didn't need, seem to need those things. Or I certainly wasn't counted on to provide those things, it was like there was another force, so there was another presence there that had joined in on the travels that was handling those things. And it was delightful, but it was very surreal. It, it just felt like, well, this is, this is a whole new way of perceiving that I had not been aware of before that point. So I feel like that's part of our, as mighty companions for one another, we're here to share our, our stories, share our experiences, share what, what has been miraculous for us, to share the miracles, to strengthen them by giving them away and sharing them. And even uh, this, this event that we did in, in Malaga, there was a woman, Maria, there who... I was just thinking about her. You were just thinking that I... I think we were out on Wednesday and you were telling me the story of Maria and on her way back to Madrid, you know, the, the car was totaled and the driver and her kind of came out of this completely total car, unscathed basically. Yeah. And then she she wrote to me on Instagram and, and sent me photos of yeah, the... Yeah, posted. Yeah, posted the car, yeah. all really smashed up and yeah. it wasn't dented, it was just really windshield and front and this devastated car and she was sharing uh, that she had come through it and that she had felt before it even happened that she felt a heat in her arm and she was aware something was going to happen and and she felt safe and secure and protected as I think the car rolled over like three times uh, and she she and the driver came out of it but but it was beautiful she, to share that. She said, please share this story, you know, as, as a witness of the miracle. And, yeah, and she was asking, uh, God, please show me that you are real. Yeah, that was her prayer. Yeah, when show she, me. When she was at the event. There you go. Show me that you're real. There you go, yeah. yeah. She said, while the car was spinning, uh, Jesus was all the time with her. Mm -hmm. And she could felt the sleep. Feel the presence, yeah. 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 And the driver's name in English is Heaven. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was like a rideshare situation yeah. that she put out that she needed to go yeah. from Malaga to Madrid and then she got an offer, yeah, come in my car, my name is Heaven. <laughs> um, her name was Lazarus, Maria Lazarus. Maria, yeah. Her name is Maria. Resurrected. Yeah. <laughs> the resurrected. Maria. Yeah, I brought her. Hi, my name is Harry, nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah. I met her in the bathroom at the event. The eye gaze, and she, she. Yeah, there was something, you know, she could feel. With John in his deep present. Yeah. Yeah. On the first day she was all wearing orange, on the second day she was wearing black. Mm -hmm. And I told her, you are at a funeral. Mm -hmm. And that's the clothes she had when it all happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She went so deep. Mm -hmm. She sat on the floor at the end of the room. Just, and I could feel her process just so deep. Yeah. Yeah. The last day. Yeah. Please God, show me that you are real. You know, that, that was the prayer that she left the event with. Yeah. And then, then that occurred, so... I just feel to invite here, because it, it's a beautiful opportunity, so it's very helpful uh, if you have something, if you carry something, to bring it to the session. Uh, if you're dealing with something in your life, you know, we can go really deep. 
like David said, it's interactive, so allow it. Um, if anyone has something that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just praying, um, because when you talk about the whole instant, it's something like just uh, shine my heart, like, oh, I just want to experience this whole instant. And, but this this situation, this thought keep coming to me to my mind and bring me so much fear and I yeah, shake and I have been in this um, in this relationship with this guy and from Sweden and um, he said like you want to have an open relationship and I said well I've never been in an open relationship before but yeah I'm open but I would like to like we could be able to be transparent and talk about it and go together and help each other with our feelings, living with our feelings. And um, but it seems like uh, he has a lot of fear to, to talk, and he was having at the same time kind of relationship with another girl. And um, and I I start to get in touch with this huge jealous and the fear. Of um, I I don't know just just a huge fear in my heart to to be abandoned abandoned and to be betrayed and just fear and um, and then I try to talk to him and explore with him and he feels like really fearful and just keeps saying like he loves me he loves me he wanna be with me. You want to be happy, but it's it's difficult for me not be able to to talk about it. And every time when we we we, we try to talk, he say, "I'm I'm fucking tired of you. Bring this subject again. I have told you like I, I love you and." Uh, and then I was having a kind of nightmare. Uh, believing my perception, like my perception was telling me that I was right, I, I found some proof that he was lying to me and he was hiding things. And I have done this with Jonas. When I met this guy, I hide things from Jonas and because for me it was very fearful to be transparent because Jonas' reaction. And, and now I'm dealing with the this, this, this same situation I just feel, um, whatever it is, I just want to, I would like the, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit could correct in my perception because it's so, it's so sad, you know, the way how I have been perceiving the situation and nothing that I think about is bringing me some peace, like nothing for, if I do this, and then I send him a message to try to communicate and, but there's, doesn't seem to to bring me peace, and sometimes I think I'm gonna end it up this relationship. But this, I feel this strong connection with him, and I'm, yeah, I also have a lot of judgment because he is not um, in the same path. Like um, he's in a different path, and yeah, all this situation, and I feel alone in Sweden, and. Um, I have been asking Jesus, like, please tell me what you would like me to do here. <laughs> because I would like to serve Jesus there, but I don't know what to do. And <laughs> and I just keep blocking <laughs> rock in my joy, you know. Um, taking a lot, a, lot, a lot of space in my mind. And I have been releasing this and asking, praying and asking for help and please just show me how to be <coughs> to be happy and to be truly helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I was talking yesterday about how through the ego we perceive this like a stratification or a hierarchy of relationships. It's just it's, it's just described as the way it is. You know, we would say meeting somebody 
or in a brief moment at a in an elevator or a shop or or on the street is is just a brief encounter. Then we have acquaintances. Then we have people who are friendships, and then close friendships, and, or they call it besties, best friends. And then we have categories for relationships that are defined more as like even the word uh, significant other uh, has a meaning. Uh, partner has a meaning. Uh, husband, wife has a meaning. That it's a category, it's a categorization of relationships. And all of those categorizations are ultimately based on linear time. They're based on concepts in the mind where there's a desire to expand and to extend. And when we think of Jesus, he talks about universal love, or agape love, or the love of God. And there's a workbook lesson uh, that basically comes right up and says, there is no love but, but God's love. That everything else that has been put in a different category, with the word love, is basically all part of the things that Jesus is sweeping up. He's sweeping, 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 and he's basically saying that, that the love of our Creator is the actual meaning of love, because it's constant, because it's, it's continuous. I was talking last night about continuity, because the continuity is, is an aspect of what love is. It's continuous, it's constant. And, and in this world, we don't have any experiences of that continuity. And that's, in a sense, it fits in with what we were talking about, about teaching the Holy Ghost. Like, it's like Jesus saying, okay, Vanessa, I, I'm giving you your calling now, to teach the Holy Ghost. And in this world, we have to say that relationships are seen as very exclusive. Very, very exclusive. Not partially exclusive very, very extremely exclusive. And we sense from Jesus and the Holy Spirit that love is inclusive. You know, he says in the Bible, take the stranger in. That's inclusivity. Take the stranger in. You know, that the ego's like, what would you do that for? <laughs> the stranger's a stranger. <laughs> Keep the stranger out. <laughs> the ego says, Keep a good, far distance from the stranger, and then Jesus says, no, take the stranger in. And what it is, 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 is like totally opening our hearts and minds to a new way of experiencing the world, where we can start to feel the inclusivity of love. And, and until we like jump into Jesus' calling, until we really jump into it, then we don't, we don't really have a clue what that would be like. Like I was feeling when I first started, it was very shy, but when I was traveling and I started to feel so welcome, I felt welcome. I was going into people's homes that I had never met, and I was feeling expansive love, and, and a huge welcome and a huge love, and then on to the next one, and on to the next one, doing experientials up on a, on the mountainside, or it it just is so vast. And and what Jesus is asking us to do is to open your heart to real love, to authentic love that's inclusive. And all of our conditioning from the past is that love is exclusive. You know, there's always limits. There's limits, and there's rules that are tied into that love on earth, we'll call it. And, and, and there's so many categories for it, and there's a lot of awkwardness. Um, even in the, the, the episode last night, when they first come together, they, you could tell they were both very frightened, and it was very awkward. Uh, he, he said, let's sit down, and she, she said, oh, he said, that's where I was sitting, you know. And even that, it was just a past association. He was just sitting there waiting for her, and he was sitting, and then she went and sat right where he was sitting. And he said, oh, she said, no, I can move. No, it's okay, okay. And, and even when they ordered, the food came to them at the beginning, and this and this, there was awkwardness. There's an awkwardness in the human condition. We have to first admit there's an awkwardness. 
we can tell ourselves we want to be with and be, connect with people that we know, and we don't necessarily know whether we trust the others, the strangers. There's a bit of a, 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 a cautionary thing when people come together. It's like the ego is underneath with his little search probing, can I trust you, can I trust you, is it safe, you know. That's going on because that's what the ego is, the ego is, is fear. The ego doesn't know love, it never will know love, because it's a belief in death, it's a, it's a death wish. We can't expect a death wish to start to grow and open up to eternal love, because it was it's the belief that there is no eternal love. So that's why we're having, asking Holy Spirit and Jesus to sort out between this unholy instant and this holy instant. We have to go for the all-inclusive love of the holy instant, and we have to let go of all the fear and limitations and doubts of the unholy instant. And we're crossing over, we're, he says we're vacillating back and forth between the, the holy instant and the unholy instant. Every moment we're vacillating back and forth, but we have to train our minds to go for that inclusiveness. And I think part of it is starting to question the belief that we can be hurt. You know, there's such a deep desire for love, and we have tried playing all the games and, and the conditions, but for what you've described, you know, with, with first with Jonas and then this, this man, that the very hiding you were doing uh, at the beginning, now you see it as, as this man doing the same thing. But, but you don't feel comfortable because Jesus says, you never hate your brother for his sins, but only for your own. In other words, you always first judge yourself before you judge anybody else. It's self-judgment. We've got an addiction of self-judgment. And it's a time addiction. We're still trying to bring the past, that unholy instant, that time of separation and terror, we're still trying to use it somehow, or pull from it, or bring it into the present. And Jesus keeps teaching us, we can't. It's gone. It's it's been handled, it's it's over. So, yeah, that's another way of talking about this experiment. Like, it might be an experiment to open our hearts up to the fullness of all-inclusive love, where there's no rejection, there's no push away, there's no hesitation, there's no fear, there's no doubt, it's just this all-inclusive love that's so welcoming, that no matter who it is, no matter where it is, you, there's this welcome feeling. You! You know, this excitement of, oh, coming together. The first time I, you saw me the other day, you came <laughs> running in the room, <laughs> grabbed me and wouldn't let me go. <laughs> but that was just, it was just your heart coming up, you know, it's just the, the love in your heart. And we want that feeling with everyone. We want that welcome. Like, like the surprise, like after this three-day retreat, I, I, there's a like a lunch being planned. I think down in uh, in Nur Nurka, uh, <laughs> in English to go Nurka. Jay is it's nice. <laughs> but, but it's kind of fun because we were talking about some people and. and we were talking Maria and Anna coming along, and then there's this young Chilean teacher of the course, 30-year-old Itzero, and then a friend of mine, Angelina, and, this, and it's just like a, a fun meeting of a group of people who have never met, really, never been together before, but there was just a, a, an excitement of doing a lunch together. And, and I was thinking, wow, out of all the different lunches like that, and lunches and dinners, over all these years, where it's just a group of people, mostly that have never met, all coming together with a shared purpose for a celebration. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's the feeling of love that I want to experience, this, this joy of the moment, this joy, it doesn't matter, you know, that, that they've never met. It doesn't matter the location, really. You know, 
having lunch together, but it's, there's just a joy with it, but there's an openness with it. And I think that's what love is, it's very open. Jesus gives us ten characteristics of the teacher of God, and the last one, he says perhaps the last one to come in is open-mindedness. And I feel like open-mindedness is completely aligned with divine love. That we have to start to really tell ourselves that, that this is natural to be open-minded, and it's natural to feel love, expansive love, and it's not natural to try to feel like it, it needs to be limited and reserved for just certain people. So, we're on a, a journey with the curriculum, and the Holy Spirit is the spirit of joy, and the Holy Spirit's curriculum is called the curriculum of joy. So, that's our pathway. Our pathway is for joy. Joy doesn't have a container. We want uncontainable joy. We want expansive joy. We want joy that has no endpoints and no limits. Of course, that's where Jesus is taking us. When he said, you know, pray for your enemies. Nobody had ever said, pray for your enemies. It just was like unheard of 2,000 years ago. Pray for your enemies. What? Pray for your enemies. And then he explains to us that if you have enemies, you have great need of prayer, because you need the power of prayer to pluck the thought of enemy from your mind. That enemy is not a concept that belongs in your holy mind. He's basically saying, instead of pray for your enemies, as if they're actual external enemies, he's, he's saying pray for them because if you believe you have an enemy, you need prayer to be free from the belief. God doesn't have enemies. God is not some anthropomorphic God who's zapping tribes and likes certain people and doesn't like other people, but God is not the human God. God is unconditional love. God only loves. There's, God is only good. There's no, there is no enemy in God. And if, if I'm a, a, a creation of God, then I must be like God as well. I must be as God created me. I must have that capacity inside me for unconditional love. I must have that. And then there's one workbook lesson where Jesus says, you believe that you are in the home of evil. That, that people would, would just, if they knew who you were, they would just recoil from you. He's telling us that who you believe you are in this world is still has an aspect of the home of evil. That if, oh, if they knew who I really was, they would never want to spend time with me. They would never want to live with me if they knew who I really was. You know, and that's what's that's the monkey mind. That's what the chatter inside is going. Oh, with all these issues, all these problems, you know, nobody would want to really know me or live with me if they knew who I really was. And then Jesus is coming and saying. No, God knows who you really are, and God hasn't changed God's mind about who you are. It, it's stable, it's constant, it's still there. It's a journey of discovery to find that expansive love, and to not be ashamed of that loving feeling. You know, sometimes people say, well, don't be too loving. What, what, what does that mean? Jesus is not saying that, don't be too loving. You know, he's. He's teaching us to love, you know, as He demonstrated, as He showed us. And, and He's giving us the Holy Spirit as our, our, our calling to extend the love, to extend the joy, to discern when things are not for us. It, sometimes we're invited or asked for different things and, and He's just discerning and they know that's not for you. But then He'll say, this is for you. He's always got something that, that is, is a calling for us. So, yeah, since I, I first met you, I, I was telling some friends the other day, I, I, I did an online seminar uh, with Brazil with my friend Marcia Mello. And, and it's not funny down there, but for yeah. Americans, <laughs> Marcia Mello is funny. Is that like, is that like a cartoon? Marcia Mello. But we, 
with me, and she invited a psychotherapist on, and she was she's an artist. She was on, and we did it, and then you were on there, and you were all wide-eyed and felt Jesus and love and connection, and then that's that was our first connection, and then you've just gone on from there and taken lots of steps to open your heart. So with what you're going through right now, it's still the same opportunity to open your heart. It's just that when, when you say your partner is saying he's into open relationship, that needs to be a discovery, because to the work, to the ego, it has its own version of open relationship. You see, it's different. Jesus would say open relationship is relationship on purpose. If you share the same purpose, you have an open relationship. You can share that freely and extend that openness and that purpose with anyone and everyone with no hesitation whatsoever, because it's the Holy Spirit. We're here to share the Holy Spirit, you know, to share the joy of the Holy Spirit, and that purpose is what makes it an open relationship. To the world, the ego has its own definitions, and it's, it may sound like it uses the word open relationship, but there are definitely restrictions on the ego's open relationship. Because there's still, if you really are open, you can find rules. There's still rules that are, they're different rules, but they're rules. <laughs> still they're rules. And, and love doesn't have an opposite. That I am under no laws but God it means I am under the law of love and the law of love. True divine love is the only law that there is. It's the only law that there is because God is is the creator of love. So any kind of any kind of law or rule would have to be in alignment with that love. And it it does seem scary to to go this journey because of self hatred. If if I perceive any self hatred in myself, then there will be a temptation to project it onto what seems to be others, and to, to push some away and say, no, not about this, not this, you know. And that's very common in the world. I meet so many families and they'll start talking about one of their family members and they say, oh, we haven't spoken in 35 years. And I say, do you want to speak? No. <laughs> It's really good. We haven't spoken for 35 years, and I like it that way. I hope it goes on for another 35 <laughs> years. You know? I say, you don't want to talk to them at all. We have nothing to say. Oh, why don't you have anything to say? We have nothing in common. See, it's a position of isolation and differences. It's a breaking. The ego likes to break off communication, because communication is all about seeing the all-inclusiveness of love, and the ego breaks communication, and then it tries to restart communication in another way that it controls, and then if it doesn't meet the rules of the ego, it will break that off too. So it's constantly starting and breaking communication, and, and yet, I saw a quote on Facebook, where it was uh, talking about mobile phones, like I was just using the mobile phone, that even the mobile phones may leave us as well, but the communication continues even when the mobile phones are gone. The bodies go, the communication is internal, it continues. The mobile phones go, the communication continues. That's what we're being taught, to, to not hold anything private and secret and separate, and to be able to share the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit inspires with everything and everyone, as, as the Spirit directs. Mm -hmm. So, that's, I, that's the lesson, I think. You, you can forgive yourself for any thoughts you have of, that, that your partner is hiding something from you. And then, you know, it's not so much that, that your partner needs to have the same belief system as you in terms of Form. You know, sometimes people say, I want somebody who studies the Course, you know, or something, and it doesn't go that way. But it does mean that you feel there's an open, free-flow 
of communication. But you could go and say, okay, you, you want an open relationship, let's talk about that. Let's really talk about that. What, what does that mean? And then you can talk about no private thoughts, not trying to please, you know, talk about what's on your heart and, and offer that and extend that. And, and realize that the Holy Spirit is with you and that Jesus is with you and there's nothing that can hold you back from extending what's most important in your heart. Nothing can hold you back from that. Yeah. Then you start to feel empowered. Oh yeah, this is what I want. Yeah, yeah when I saw you the first time, I have never heard someone talking about Jesus and the relationship with Jesus in, in a such deep way. And I just had this feeling like I'm I'm also in this relationship. I just felt I'm in. I was together with you and Jesus while you were sharing, and it was so strong in my heart. And sent you a message, and while I was writing the message, I was writing a lot of the story, and the guidance was not was like talk from your heart, be straight. And then when I sent to you the message, and your your answer was like, I feel your heart. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just, I just fall in love with you. I love you so much today. And I feel so grateful for you. Sometimes this, I say, Jesus, help me to behave be before I came here. <laughs> because when I went to Mexico, to Mexico, I couldn't speak English as so, like I can today. And I just want to be close to you. Just want to hug you and. I just felt this joy that you share, and yeah, I just you know, yeah, I, I don't know how to express and this world, but I, I love you. Yeah, love you so. let's share it with the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Let's share it with the whole world. Yeah, that's that's our calling. We're we're called to the holy instant, so that's what we're feeling. We're feeling activated. Yeah, Jenny and Barrett were writing to me saying, oh, Vanessa would like to come. And I know you had wanted to come to our Strawberry Festival, but that was all the way across the world. This was just across Europe, instead of <laughs> <laughs> across the, the world, half of the world. So, yeah, it's beautiful. And you'll be joining us in Barcelona, too, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Another 57 people, yeah. So, there'll be a lot of opportunities to extend your heart there, yeah. in a monastery. <laughs> <laughs> You're concerned about behaving and then we just send you to a monastery. <laughs> You've got to love that sense of humor. Like, oh, well, I've got you. <laughs> It's so difficult to be, to feel spirit then. And I ask and ask and ask and... Yeah. And the way that you said something about if you knew, feel this deep, deep, deep self-hatred and fear of punishment. Yeah, like that fear of self-punishment, and then it's like that's what that section when we I came here first and we did that, that little session on shadows from the past. You know, the people that represent everything that I thought I did wrong, and they're acting it out. And then there's a fear, there's a fear of the people, and sometimes it feels like, yeah, how can I avoid this? What do I? Do I need to be a hermit? Do I need to live like a hermit? And yeah. So in that sense, you know, it's coming here or coming to participate in community. It's, it's a huge leap of faith. It's a huge leap of trust. But you also have to be very gentle with yourself and say, you know, this is very intense 
for me. I need to take gentle, small steps to to learn to trust and open up. It's a, it's a whole different way of perceiving. And you have to be very gentle when I think about that too. And over the years, when I sometimes adopted a, a, a stray animal or whatever, I, I, I remember that this little piece house I had these uh, two kittens that had been abandoned um, in the woods of northern Kentucky. I, I accepted them into this house where I was, and when these two little female kittens came into the house, they were so frightened that they, once they were put down on the floor, they ran immediately and hid under the, the furniture because they were so frightened. And, and one of the sisters was born with only three legs, with a tripod, and the, the sister was angel. But it took a long time of just softness and gentleness and and very much of a peaceful welcome for them to kind of come around and come out from under the chairs on their own time when they were ready. And little by little they would come out and then they started to play a little bit with each other and they became more relaxed and more playful. But it took, really when I see it, was years of trust to build up and develop that feeling where they felt more naturally who they are. But they, from their accumulated experiences of the past, it had just been such a hiding. So, so, so much defense. And then it seems hard to open up to love and, and trust. And it does seem to me, that's why Jesus calls it stages of the development of trust. He knows how how frightening it has been, and that it's going to take stages to come out of that. But we shouldn't put pressure on ourselves to think, now I've got to be completely different than I've been. I, it's going to be staging, slowly, slowly building trust and confidence that's going to bring us out of it. So, yeah, that's that's beautiful. And the thing that you're doing is just to be able to speak up about it is a huge thing too, because it's, it's part of the, the keeping apart and keeping the fear has been the hiding, hiding it. Don't, don't let it show, don't let it show. It's a sign of whatever weakness or whatever the ego will say. But this is a different path where it's like just speaking it up, speaking it up, kind, kindly, gently giving yourself that permission to just express it and speak it up. And little by little, each time you do it, it gets a little bit easier. You know, just you just keep doing it and it just gets easier and easier. So thank you, that's, that's huge. Before you go off to the kitchen team, you <laughs> <laughs> have something important to, to get up and out. Yeah, yeah, that's it. yeah I just wanted to. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I was just in the beginning, you said maybe like a her hermit, or I, and I, I've done that so long, like in the woods. And I just realized I couldn't do it anymore because I, I just got messed in my head and avoiding everything. And here, I've been here for three months now, and there's no avoiding here. Everything comes with its right importance. It's like <laughs> immense. Yeah. yeah, and there have been miracles also with eating. I couldn't hardly eat anything, and it's been really, really good. I've been eating so many things here now. It's such a huge miracle. Yeah, yeah. Like, I can finally let go of Eva because uh, I can't be her. It feels like that. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to be human, I, don't want, I just want to be spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Uh, you just felt maybe inside that you just didn't fit into this world, and then you come here and say, Yes, you do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and not who you thought you were either. <laughs> yeah. Ava doesn't fit in the world, but none of the personality has fit very well. <laughs> Everyone's awkwardly broken through, you know, 
intensities and emotions and dealing with all the intense complexities of, of the belief in this world. And you're just like, it's like you just are hopping out of the plane with a parachute on. <laughs> okay, I'm going to soar a little bit and then pull my parachute and then come in for a soft, soft landing. Yeah. So, yeah, it's good to enjoy that part of you because it felt, I'm sure it felt very close and isolated and it just seems fearful when you feel like you have to guard and protect against so many things. It's like self-judgment, self-condemnation that starts into some kind of cycle. And then the cycle turns into almost like a tornado of, of thoughts, of self-critical thoughts. And then Jesus comes zooming in the, 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 the spirit to rescue, to take you out of the tornado. You know, it's like, okay, slow it down, slow it down here, and let this happen, and open to this, and then you start to meet people and you know, slowly you can express more and you know, it just builds it up. Like a flower that's closed up in the in the winter and then in the spring there you go. You're blooming. <laughs> You're gonna bloom now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I feel I want to share about the um, my relationship with Mary. Um, yeah, like since the last retreat, we were here together, and, and on the last day, um, kind of unexpectedly, we we joined and we felt something happening there, and then yeah, joining online daily because she lives like in another part of Europe than I do, so we we joined online. And we both felt this calling to keep joining and to, uh, yeah, to just uh, follow the guidance. But, yeah, that's not bad. But I, I just want to <laughs> share about the experience. Mm, I feel like I've been facing so much in this given relationship. Because it's like way out of my comfort zone. It's not actually in alignment with many of my preferences I used to have as a, as, yeah, as Daniel, so to say. But still, I feel this calling. So I want to go towards it, but it's also pretty fearful at times. Like this morning, we walked and I shared, I shared with her the fear I have, like about like committing to this relationship. And um, yeah, for now we we've just been kind of considering it as a companionship, but. And I don't know what the steps will be. Um, yeah, but I want to be open because I feel it's so healing. It's washing so many, washing away so many, so many things. But at times I just think like, why am I even doing this? You know, I just want to hide, want to retract into some kind of safe place in myself, or even yeah, just run away from it. So yeah. And many times you can see what what gift it is. Like I've heard so many uh, examples about this given relationship, which is just way beyond like what you used to experience as a relationship. Like like picking and choosing like the right partner and then just yeah making it into something. It was like such a different experience. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share it and and and. Yeah, put it out there because I, yeah, I think that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's quite quite strong because a lot of times so many things that were hidden get mirrored and brought up to the surface, and that's, that generates what feels like a, like a vulnerability feeling, like you were saying, I'm way out of my comfort zone, or this is way beyond. You know, where before the ego had us in an old mode of relationships, like like when you go grocery shopping, you know, you're checking out the the carrots and the tomatoes, and you're you're just shopping. It's like you're shopping around for what you want and what you need, and then the ego does that with relationships too. But but when you pray a prayer for healing, then the spirit's like, oh, okay, then I will provide the 
the means here, and then it's much more intense than it seemed before. And it, it also builds your faith and trust much faster, because you have to keep trusting something that's unseen, that you're opening up to, you feel your heart opening up, you feel there's something there, you can feel your heart opening up, and intuitively that feels good and right, and then you just have to keep open without going in that direction, and going and going and going. But it's, a lot of it's just about communication, you know, with the old way there was, there was definitely hidden parts that were, there was a desire to keep them hidden, and this is more of like opening all the doors, and really air things out, and to, to face things that, that were kept hidden, and kept private. And you don't want that anymore. You, know, you don't want to put the energy into trying to keep that identity together. So it's, it's very much a loosening of the personal identity, and that's really what it's designed for. That's, that's how the Spirit uses relationships, you know, to to open the heart up, and so it's beautiful that you've come a couple times, and now here you are again, and now yeah, just putting putting it out and saying, here we are. <laughs> We're going through all the all the the healing that has to happen, and in one sense, saying, hold us in your prayers, you know, be with us, you know, so we can feel the the love and support for that. That you're not like on your own, you know, there's, there's a presence, there's a love, there's a support for that. So, it's very beautiful. So right now it's still more over the internet, I guess, except for occasional... Yeah, that's things. actually a good question, because like right after retreat, she will be back in Finland for a couple of days, and then she'll travel to Holland and stay with me in Holland for five weeks. Part of that stay will be a retreat with Jenny in, uh, in, in the place where I live, in Zutland. So it's kind of, yeah, we, we kind of see it as our own devotional we have like going on. Just, yeah, just continuing in this, uh, in this thing, and then we'll see from there. Five weeks yeah. devotional and culminating with around December or something, 15th or? 12 to yeah. 15th. 12 yeah. to 15th. 12 to 15th, yeah. yeah. That'll be the end of it. <laughs> that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, and there's also some anxiety around that because I'm kind of taking her like into my life, my normal life, and so it's fun like, with my children and with my acquaintances there and, and things. And then also, yeah, it, it brings up a bit of fear, but also I feel like, okay, let's go for this. Yeah. Let's really yeah, rinse it all away. Yeah. yeah, it's beautiful to give it to the Holy Spirit and just say, well, we'll see how this goes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah with open mind, yeah. Yeah. That's it. yeah, we can't really foresee how the script is supposed to look, but we can come in there with openness and willingness, and the prayer of healing. Yeah. Like that radio that came down to our weekend event, and said, I want to have an experience that God, you're there, that you're real, and then, yeah, it was after the, the, the uh, car spinning around and everything that she felt that, that was her answer, that she felt it was coming, and it was all part of an experience to, to convince and to trust deeper. Yeah, so that's what you're doing too. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, maybe I have one more thing to add, because they just got in touch with that, which has also been in my mind, like, there's this, yeah, maybe this fear of, like, continuing, deepening on this journey, that, like, the next big leap will be asked of me in terms of, like, big reconfiguration in my life, like, with my role as a father, or, like, yeah, there's always has, has, has has been this fear around, like, uh, yeah, being asked to kind of step out of my father role or to, yeah, leave my children, basically. That's that's actually, like, the concrete fear there. Um, yeah, that's also something I want to yeah, just put on the altar here and say, like, okay, 
like Hirokita said yesterday, like thinking about like the, the situation of her uh, man and child, child rolling off the hill or something, you know, and then just coming to this prayer. I, I only want to, yeah. Um, do you, do you remember how you said it? Like, I want to do God's will or something. Yeah, I just really wanted to, God's will to be done because I wanted to, I wanted to, know God's will. Yeah, when we open up to God's will, we're really saying, rearrange my perception and wherever I had distorted perception, help me see it anew, help me see it in a new light, in a new way. So, it can bring up sadness when, when we think in terms of, of something being there and then being gone, but I think it's, it's always like, it's always like everything is being repurposed, we're being brought more into alignment with forgiveness, which is our happiness and everyone's happiness. It's, it's the joy mm -hmm. for everyone. It's the way of seeing the world that lines up and reflects vision, spiritual vision. You know, that's what we're praying for. But the belief in loss and, and sacrifice, or those, those are deep-seated ego beliefs. And there's a fear associated with them, of course, because they they're, they've been something that we've been trying to play out in this world, and now we're being asked to fulfill a purpose of extending this, this healing, this forgiveness with everyone and everything. But I do like to think of it as like more of a repurposing. It's not, it's not like saying that, that something has to shift and look a certain way in form, but we're, we're letting go of our uh, attachment and investment to holding on to something, a self-concept that we had, and saying, repurpose it. And then all we're doing is we're just saying to the Holy Spirit, here are all of these symbols that the ego made. Now they serve the ego's purpose. And it, it felt tight and closed down and intense. Now I want to see them all in a new light where I see them in a different purpose than the purpose for which they were made. They were made in hatred by the ego, but I don't want that anymore. I don't want that anymore. I know with my biological family, you know, I started traveling and teaching and sharing and around the United States and around in Canada and then more countries, more countries. And and naturally, it just started coming out of my mouth. I started to talk about the parable of David. We were talking about that the other day, the parable of Javi, the parable of David. It was just, it flowed out of my mouth one day. I never said anything like it before. And I would say the parable of David and his biological family and everything. So one time I had a friend of mine who, who uh, was, had come to visit me in Cincinnati where my biological birth was and family. And he was so into spirituality, but he had changed his name uh, from Howard Carpenter to Love, Joy, Divine. He changed his name from Howard Carpenter to Love, Joy, Divine. So he was there visiting me at my peace house, and then my sister, biological sister, said, um, why don't you come out, we're going to do a birthday party, and I said, I have a friend visiting, and she said, well, bring your friend along. So we go out with the family for one of her children and a birthday party celebration, and we walked into the restaurant, and my friend, not only did he change his name to Love Joy Divine, but when he would greet people, he would say, hi, my name is Love Joy Divine, and so are you. <laughs> and, and people don't like being told who they are. <laughs> I, it's just you know, it's like from years and years and years. It's, it's one thing for you to say who you are, but don't try to tell people who they are. <laughs> and this, so are you. And this is your name too. 
So I went to my sister and he said, Hi, my name is Love, Joy, Divine, and so are you. And she smiled and she said, I'm the biological sister. She must have heard <laughs> my talk. <laughs> That's how she is. And I was like looking. This is surreal. <laughs> Love Joy Divine. I'm the biological sister. <laughs> So, but it just gets to be more and more hilarious because, you know, we, we do start to feel shifts in the way that we see ourselves and others. And, and then we just have to relax and learn to just not get caught up with any words or titles or names or anything. And, and just come back to that presence, come back to our heart, feel what's in our heart, feel the love that wants to just extend in a natural way without being concerned about the labels or how things are and and it's it's beautiful because that way we can stay in this soft kind of connected relationship with everyone and everything without thinking we have to make something be a certain way. And yeah, that's that's just what we're going through with, with all our relationships. You know, it's you know, you can see it. You can see it in certain movies where the main character, one of the movies I was thinking of showing for this weekend is a movie called Source Code, where the main character, you know, when you, when you get into the movie, it's apparent that he seems to be in some kind of a scenario where other people think he's somebody else than who he is. They're calling him by a different name and everything. It's a consciousness movie to start to show us that when we're identified with our mind and our consciousness, then we see the world in a completely different way and not as if through the character's eyes. Uh, it's just a very different way of looking at the world. And that's what we're training our mind toward, that expansive new way of looking at the world. And it's so different from the, the personal perspective that we've had. And from the personal perspective, it just seems like there's a fear of letting go. Like, what will become of my, my children, what will become of my life, my world as I've known it, as I open up to this more expansive perspective. But that's just very common. We have to allow those, those feelings to come up. And for me, I know I would travel and come back to Cincinnati. It would be, everything would shift it a little bit, then I'd go out and travel again for four or five, six weeks, come back, everything is shifted again. Oh my gosh, what's happening? Go out again, come back, shift, you know, shifts in awareness keep happening. And we, there's a little bit of discomfort with every shift in awareness. Because the first shift that we experienced was the seeming fall from grace. Mm -hmm. So every time we have a shift, even in a good way, even when we're expanding, we still associate it with that first shift from beingness and Christ to egoic. You know, that was like, a, that was, it was traumatic. So we're all dealing with one sense of like post-traumatic stress syndrome. Mm -hmm. But it's with the separation from God, it's not with a, an event in Vietnam or a, a, an event in time and space. We're dealing with a traumatic event that seems to have occurred in our mind, and we're healing from that trauma. And now we're coming very slowly to open up and heal from that trauma, to be more loving, to be more loving in a natural way. So there's always a bit of disorientation, awkwardness. And then after a while it just it's you start to go, Oh yeah, that's that's I said yes to this, so mm. uh, there's gonna be certain amounts of disorientation that happen. But it's more like we we don't judge them so critically like we did before. Like something's wrong. <laughs> yeah, stop, something's wrong, you know. Yeah. So we just relax. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah, great to see you, David. Likewise.
Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so how are we doing? We've got a little while before our lunch time. Yeah, we've got about 20 minutes. 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Yeah. Seem to bring up some emotions. This theme of having children and having the calling. We we're going to talk later, and we want to talk now. The, the thing that lies over the surface all the time is just not wanting to be seen. There's, I want to look more composed, or you know, there's just shame around. The fear to speak is that all the emotions then come up. And just uh, not making sense. But when Daniel started sharing, because on the journey in this morning, we didn't really sp- we haven't been speaking on the journeys backwards and forwards, we've been in the silence mostly. And I saw Daniel and Mary in the road. And it just came out of my mouth, like there was no control over it. I just said, oh, that's so, they're so sweet, them two. There's like a real flow between them that I could feel in my heart as we drove past. And just with Daniel sharing that, then it was like permission. For... And just, I feel terror, terror. I feel absolute terror of the love. Even just saying to Jenny and Barry this morning, I'd like to join with you today. It's just fear. The power of the mountain. I'm scared of the power of that. And I just feel like I haven't got a choice. Jenny and Robert keep saying, just jump off the cliff. Just go for it. (laughs) 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 Jenny sent me a video that was the same, like, you've come to the abyss and you just need to dive in. (sighs) And I feel like that cartoon character that's digging its heels in, but I'm being pushed. There anywhere. Mm-hmm. There's, no, there's nothing left in my life, really. It's just, there's nothing left apart from the children. And, oh, this whole retreat so far. When you've been talking about what you value, it's like this is just, uh, I don't want to accept that there's no value in that. And so, but I've had this sense like this grief and fear, it's never ending while I still want to hold on to the idea that there's value and, and the belief that. There's lots of beliefs as well, like a mother's love can't be replaced. (laughs) (coughs) And the belief in being hurt, hurting them and being hurt. Just not wanting to, there's some stubbornness in me that doesn't want to let go of that. And then there's other times when I just absolutely want to go for it, you know. And there's a bit there for sharing. Mm. Mm. 
Yeah, I think he's done well to articulate it too, because our, our true creation is in such power and glory and vastness and magnitude, and then the ego has, has brought about a self-concept and a belief that his littleness, uh, we, we have become accustomed to littleness. We have been taught to just be content with the little that you are, and, and that takes different forms for different people, but there's, there's like a clinging or a holding or a hugging to what's familiar. We, now we're addicted to the familiar. And, and we push the vastness, the magnitude out of awareness. And, and because we've done that, we've become accustomed and familiar with the familiar and addicted to it and, and dissociated from the magnitude. That love is so huge, so powerful, that even when we make the slightest turn toward it, the emotions come, it's like all those movies of homecoming when you finally, the fun, end of the movie is this grand homecoming and the, the, the violins come up and the music comes up and our heart blasts open and we sit in the movie theater and we just cry and cry and cry and cry. We're coming home, like there's a, a feeling of coming home. But also it's a, coming home to magnitude, to such glory and such vastness. I've had people that have done the Course in Miracles workbook lessons a number of times and they say, I did pretty good at the beginning and then I'm going along pretty good and then I reach those set of lessons on holiness. That I'm holy. Everything, my holiness blesses the world. There's nothing my holiness cannot do. They hit the holiness lessons and they go, I can't do those. I cannot do those. They say, I was going good. Until he started talking about holiness and my holiness. Ah, yikes, God, <laughs> do you know who you're talking about? You know, it's like, it's just, it's so deeply ingrained, the littleness is so heavily ingrained and reinforced that holiness seems scary, you know. Oh, that one's holy, oh sure, that, Jesus is holy, good, Mary's holy, good, that's all right, but, <laughs> You know, we, we hold on to a self-concept that we feel, we feel afraid in, you know, to consider that. And, and that's why we need lots of miracles. We need lots and lots of miracles to open our heart up and slowly show us, convince us of, of the glory that, that we are. You know, it's just not the way we think of our, ourselves. So, I find that that can be the scariest thing is when we start to begin to, to be open to come out of the familiar and just open up to new encounters. To, it's a scary prayer to say, okay, Spirit, have your way with me. I did a six, six week retreat in Mallorca one time and I would think we were like a, through like four, four and a half or five weeks and I had to go to Barcelona. And before I was leaving, I, I said, yeah, if you really want to close this retreat out with a big explosion of opening, I said, just, just say to the Holy Spirit, bring it on. Just pray to the Holy Spirit, bring it on, Holy Spirit. And much to my surprise, that it was like that song, that uh, scene from uh, with Robin Williams, uh, so then we were at the Captain My Captain and mm -hmm. Dead Society, where he stands up and, much to my surprise, he started standing up to the people one by one, throwing their arms up in there. Bring it on, Holy Spirit! <laughs> Bring it on, Holy Spirit! And then the, the room started standing up and, and I said, okay, I'm off to Barcelona, but you did you asked for it. <laughs> and then when I came back, yeah, there was... Oh, they all had to share all that they went through when they said at the top of their lungs, bring it on Holy Spirit. Because it felt good and right, and because they wanted to welcome the healing, they wanted to have that spark of truth and trust and faith. And then there were these huge shifts that took place at the end of the 
six weeks uh, with such an open heart and such willingness. So in that sense, it's a little bit like the jumping off of a, of a cliff. That was a, when they were throwing their arms up. Sometimes one person would do it, but they were all standing up and throwing their arms up. Bring it on, Holy Spirit! You know. I was just, okay, I'm going to Barcelona, but just remember you asked for this. <laughs> um, and then it was fun to hear all their miracles when I came back. Oh my gosh, they just had boatloads of miracles to share from them. They asked for it. They didn't limit their asking. They really asked for it. And they, yeah. So, it's courageous. It's brave. Yeah, it takes, you have to be brave. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm just wondering something about the nouns, but I don't know about what time, but we can always talk about another time. Uh, just, uh, just thinking about. Um, when you, we, we describe, for example, the feeling of falling in love, we were sort of sharing that yesterday, and you know, when you feel that, obviously, uh, well, maybe not obviously, but I sense, you know, yeah, I want more of this, this is the way I want to go, and then I totally understand that the aim is not to grasp, hold tight, um, but that's the bit that I don't get how to do when you found something good. <laughs> And that's a bit hasn't clicked in my brain yet. How you then can be feeling this is great, but also not this is equally great. Mm. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's really yeah. I yeah, where I'm kind of at at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I think it's that we're still we've been so accustomed to getting and so conditioned to getting that that when something wonderful appears, our inclination is to, to grasp it, or to hold it, or to possess it in some way. And that's what's getting undone. In fact, in the workbook lesson today, I was just noticing that uh, it was workbook lesson 300. If I can go to that, because he does use the word grasp, grasp and and possessed in that uh, in that lesson, which is interesting when Jesus is using that. He's talking about those who come to this world, uh, for their joys are gone before they are possessed or even grasped. That's that is a, that's a, like a sad thing for everyone on this planet. Their joys are gone before they are possessed or even grasped. And, and basically, he's telling us that, that basically in order to maintain that continuity of that love, you know, that wonderful feeling of love. I want this to go on forever and ever and ever. The ego is saying, grab it quickly and hold it. <laughs> Almost like we had a, a little kitten or a happy little dog in the room and it's just tugging this out and the tail's wagging and it's just spreading this joy all over and this like, the ego's like, grab it! Grab that joy! You want some of that for yourself, grab it! And Jesus is saying, no, you can't you can't grab it, you can't hold it, you can't possess it, you can't even grasp it. That we have to be trained in order to experience, we have to give it. By extending it, is how we keep it. You see how different that is from our conditioning. We want to possess it. We, as soon as we have something expansive, we want to immediately possess it. How can I own it? How can I control it? And so that's what's getting undone, is, is through the giving. So for me, that was the experience when I started traveling, shining, sharing, very different from anything I'd ever done, but 
It's like the Spirit was saying, yes, yes, just stay with me, stay with me, keep giving it, keep extending it. And the ego feels there's a threat with that. Like, it's all going to cave in on you and you're going to be, oh, in worse position than ever. But there's a faith in us that's like, no, we, need, we want to keep sharing it and giving it and extending it. So, I will definitely keep that in mind for like our movie tonight, because there's some really good movies where the, the main characters start to get into opening up and giving, and then they really have to stay with it for it to stay, stay with them. If they, if they try to control it or grasp it or own it or possess it, then it, it's, it shuts it off. But when they stay open-hearted and they keep taking those leaps of faith and giving, 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 then a whole new, it's like a whole new realm opens up where we see, oh it is possible, but not in any way that we ever imagined. Only under the Spirit's direction do we open up. We all want to fall in love and we want it to be continuous. We don't, we don't want those choppy kind of ends. It's heartbreaking ends to it. We want it to go on forever and ever and ever. And, and Jesus is saying, yes, very good, very good, and, and I'll show you the way. So, it's just our willingness to, to really go with that and say, yeah, that's, that's our inheritance, that's our birthright, that's our, that's what we're entitled to. We're entitled to the heart opening, to those miracles. And uh, we can't look to the past though to find the formula. It's, it's a lot of trust, a lot of present trust that comes. But maybe not directed to one, like not focusing in, in the way I'm you know, thinking of an individual. It's to try and let go of that. But when we're talking about that feeling of falling in love, it usually is focused on a specific um, I, I don't some 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 specific, but that's what we want to let go of, is it? The, that it's focusing this this to one is to let go of that focus. Yeah, it's like it's like when you start to feel it, it's almost like it, there's a crack in the veil, and right in front of you, there's a crack, and there's light streaming through right on you, and 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 so we want that that crack to get wider. <laughs> But the ego is like, grab it, possess it, yeah. you know, <laughs> contain it, control it, you know. The ego is, is trying to find it in things, in people, in forms, and, and it, Jesus says, uh, seek not outside yourself, meaning in the world of images, seek not outside yourself, for it will fail and you will weep each time an idol falls. But we don't, we can't deny that when we meet someone, there's, there's an experience of an opening or a light. And, and we want to go with that, but it's more like the slit. We really are praying that this, the, the crack that we're perceiving in the veil, it just keeps opening in our mind, wider and wider, so we can see it everywhere. We want to see it everywhere, in a broader vision. So, that's great. Don't deny the love that you feel. All of us have had that. We're going and we're floating around, all of a sudden we meet somebody and our heart starts to flutter. We go, what's this? <laughs> what's this strange emotion? <laughs> <laughs>